You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today returning to the show is Phil Magnus. Phil, welcome back to Economics Detective Radio. Hey, thanks for having me. So today we're going to be doing the second episode in the series I'm doing about American slavery, the history of that, and some of the uh, the controversy around the modern literature about it. Previously, I spoke to Robert Wright about you know the persistence of modern slavery, the politics around reparations today, and uh, the the many externalities of uh, of the slave economy, negative externalities that made it uh, questionably efficient, even if it was profitable for the individual slave owners. Today, we're talking to Phil from a more cleometric angle, uh, I think. So, Phil, this whole slavery debate, we're recording this in August of 2019. It's been sparked. Right. The most recent debate was sparked by the New York Times 1619 project, but this was a pre existing debate in, in economic history. Do you want to talk a little bit about the literature that uh, the, the debate around this topic in academia? Yeah, yeah. So the 1619 Project, for uh, listeners that aren't familiar, it's this uh, New York Times series that seeks to uh, basically resituate uh, American understanding of the role of slavery in history. So it's, it's actually a really important and interesting issue that uh, by all uh, all accounts merits attention. But the way they went about it is uh, they depended on a, a, a branch of academic literature that comes from the School of Historiography that's popped up in the last 10 or 15 years. It's referred to as the new history of capitalism. And basically what uh, NHC, as I call it for short, or as it's often abbreviated, uh, maintains is that uh, American capitalism is kind of inextricably tied to slavery. They bo- they both emerge uh, not only simultaneously, but they're, they're, they're kind of co-causes of each other in the 18th and 19th century. And one of the extrapolations from this literature is that capitalism today and all the wealth that we enjoy, all the wealth of the American economy uh, surrounding it are derivative of this historical relationship between capitalism and slavery. So it comes with a very strong ideological uh, background or baggage that's carried to uh, Basically, to the table in uh, the scholarly works of this literature, they uh, they start from a uh, a premise that is anti-capitalistic in its ideological outlook, and very specifically seeks to uh, to tie capitalism to the sin of slavery, to the stain of this uh, horrific uh, system of production that existed 150 years ago. And the idea is that the, uh, the the stain of that sin is carried forward, that the uh, stain of slavery still taints capitalism today, and therefore we need to either modify our commitment to free markets, we need to overturn uh, our utilization of a capitalistic economic system, and engage in economic redistribution as amends, as our atonement for uh, the supposed historical link that they've claimed. Right. So that that sort of ideological element the element that relates to modern politics is why this uh this is controversial and not just sort of a historical curiosity it uh it probably probably that element alone is what sells a lot of books and uh right. <laughs> and uh, ma- magazines in the case of the New York Times and and then it creates debate online ba- backlash from from some people like yourself who who are very familiar with the literature and some people who you know just don't like the message the sort of main essay in the 1619 project that cites this new history of capitalism literature is the one by Matthew Desmond it's titled right. in order to understand the brutality of american capitalism you have to start on the plantation so i i read that article um do you think uh like before we criticize it do you think there's a uh, there's, you know, a sort of anything to agree with in it. Is there like a, a core of sort of useful or interesting uh, observations that uh, that are maybe uncontroversial? Uh, just to to start with the points of agreement before diverging yeah, to the yeah. points of disagreement. 
Well, I think just more broadly, investigating what drove the slave economy is a uh, an important academic question, and it's something that scholars have been investigating since the time of slavery itself. Adam Smith wrote about the economics of slavery and tried to disentangle what was going on on the plantation system in the British colonies at the time. Uh, he, he's writing on this as early as the 1750s, and it really comes out in The Wealth of Nations in 1776 that there are economic dimensions to the way that plantations operate, and it pertains to the labor system. It also pertains to the political system that's propping up slavery and making it uh, this viable economic instrument. He basically, uh, Smith basically argues that without politics, without government to sit there and enforce slavery uh, and make it viable, uh, the system would, uh, would, would face greater market competition from free labor. And uh, that would play out uh, probably over the course of many years, if not decades, in ways that are disadvantageous to slavery. But the fact that the political system had intruded and basically subsidized it by enforcing slavery had given it a leg up, had, had effectively made it profitable. So this is a uh, an age old discussion that's been going on for for centuries it's an important part of the literature today as we look back on uh, on what the legacy of slavery is. There is a very clear uh, amount of empirical evidence that shows a wealth gap that occurs on racial lines in the United States. And that wealth gap is derivative of uh, some of the effects and legacies of slavery. There's also been good empirical work out of uh, economics. Uh, in particular, Nathan Nunn at Har Harvard has done several studies on this effect, and he's shown that uh, the counties and states where plantation slavery was most prevalent in the 1800s lag economically today, 150 years later, uh, compared to counties that did not have slavery or had lower concentrations of plantations in them. So uh, we have empirical evidence that slavery itself had this extractive harm on the slaves, on African Americans historically that has carried forward into the present day. And that harm has been very clearly impoverishing. So I think that's an important question to ask, an important area to, area to study. The problem that comes about in Desmond's piece is he relies entirely, 100%, on this new history of capitalism literature that brings this ideological objective uh, to the table, that brings this baggage of a preset anti-capitalistic uh, ideological claim to its unit of analysis. And one of the results of that is he, he tells a story that ends up uh, – basically being based on current politics and projecting that backward onto the path. It's basically taking an anti-capitalist viewpoint and setting that cart in front of the horse of the, uh, uh, the economics of the slave system. So he gets the entire interpretive look on the question backwards. And in the process, one of the results is that he ends up ignoring and sidestepping uh, thousands of pages of well-documented, well-developed historical literature of the type that I just mentioned that does document the very real nature of this problem. Mm, yeah, yeah. So the Desmond piece, uh, just three on the third paragraph, uh, brings up how, you know, only 10% of American workers are unionized, whereas, uh, you know, in other countries uh, like Iceland has 90% right. unionization. And it, it's kind of a weird thing to to bring up in a discussion about slavery, uh, and I don't think there's a, I I don't think anyone that I've seen has established a really clear causal link. Those seem like um, somewhat unrelated observations. Right, right. If you go into the history of unions in the United States, especially in the early 20th century. The unions themselves were often drivers of segregationism. They, they wanted to keep uh, poor blacks out of competition from the white laboring classes. So uh, unions would often exclude black members or they'd support uh, laws such as minimum wages, knowing that that would squeeze uh, African-Americans out of the workforce and in turn benefit their own position. So uh, there's a whole racial history of unions that's basically omitted from the story. Uh, yet you have someone like Desmond who has strong political views today about where uh, where he situates unions in the economy and also strong political views about 
uh, taxation and redistribution and inequality, strong political views about the 2008 financial crisis. So he's making this leap using this uh, this really suspect and ideological branch of the scholarship on slavery to try and tie all of his pet projects, his pet modern day political issues back to the plantation system. Yeah, yeah. So it so that you know it's a complex relationship between slavery and unions where yeah the uh the sort of aftermath of slavery and jim crow and segregation and those things all play into the the rise of unionization um but it's sure. not really clear that america's lack it's of unionization <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah going going possibly in the wrong direction maybe Maybe in um, an American history without slavery, there might be even less unionization. Uh, it's hard to say. That's that's uh, something for someone to write write their thesis on. <laughs> um, right. But uh, so Desmond also, you know, he kind of he points to, you know, the the Southern slave economy and points to a lot of the sort of complex financial arrangements and bookkeeping they did and kind of argues that you know a lot of a lot of like modern capitalist accounting and bookkeeping techniques and and monitoring of of workers and their output was developed uh because of slavery uh what what do you think about that those observations i think it's a uh, again another case of misplaced causality uh, so one of the examples they use is double entry uh, account keeping, uh, basic accounting techniques. Well, uh, plantations did operate as a business, so they they had to keep account books of um, of their expenses and account books of their income. This is a basic business practice that anyone uses, whether it's a um, a slave economy or a completely free economy or anything in between. Even the Soviet Union uses double entry accounting. So uh, th th there's kind of this leap of evidence that's made uh, where historians have correctly gone back and they've noticed the existence of account books in plantations, as you'd find anywhere else in uh, in businesses, and they, they they've made this leap of an assumption to say, well, since plantations used accounting and we use accounting today, the two must be connected. But the real history is you find the emergence of double entry accounting actually goes back to uh, Renaissance era Italy in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, so this is a, an emergence of banking institutions that comes completely independent and separate and apart from slavery. It's on an entirely different continent that these devices emerge. And it just so happens that uh, pretty much anyone and everyone that's engaged in business from that point onward in history is using uh, uh, similar accounting techniques. So an analogy I'd make, this would be a, akin to claiming that uh, uh, the automobile is responsible for uh, the illegal trade between drug cartels in South America because they happen to use cars to transport uh, illegal drugs. Uh, so yes, there, there's a device there that's uh, that's common between them. They're using a similar technology or a technique, but it's not the point of origin, origin that these historians are claiming. Uh, rather, a, it's just a mistaken identification that seems to be emerging from this literature. And one of the motives of this literature is to is to really seek out ways that make slavery look more capitalistic than it was to strengthen this modern day indictment of capitalism that a lot of these historians are seeking. So, so one one thing that uh, Desmond does is he he seems to there's maybe a little bit of no true Scotsman here. He seems to distinguish between something called American capitalism and you know other capitalism. So you know may, maybe the argument's not like capitalism in general. Uh, I think the other term he uses is low road capitalism. Maybe it's right, just right. like this particular form of capitalism practiced in the United States, which kind of makes it a little bit unfalsifiable uh but maybe maybe there's something there yeah these uh these historians they're they're remarkably fluid in their definitions of the term capitalism and they use that to their advantage to to, to really kind of brand anything and everything they dislike as capitalistic uh 
Uh, this is a problem that appears in the new history of capitalism literature itself, and there have been several historians that have openly touted the fact that they're unwilling to commit to a definition. Seth Rockman, who was one of the major uh, originators of this field in the, uh, the late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, wrote an article in one of the prominent history journals where he basically says that uh, we can't really assign a definition to capitalism. Uh, we can't say that capitalism means any one thing uh, because it's fluid. It, it evolves and it changes over history. And yet they also do this kind of turn of, of words, this, 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 uh, this little word game. So even though they won't commit to a definition of capitalism, they're absolutely certain and they'll assert outright that slavery is part of capitalism. So you've got a fluid definition that we can't really pin down, but that definition is also inclusive of slavery just by default, that it's written in there. And you go to some of the literature, some of the books that are written on these things. So Sven Beckert, who's a prominent historian in this genre at, um, at Harvard University, wrote a book uh, called The Empire of Cotton that advances one of the major theses here. And throughout his book, he goes back at, and looks at historical evidence that describe the system most uh, historians of economics and historians of economic thought would refer to as mercantilism. And this is the notion of a, a state working in partnership with, with its businesses to build up protective tariffs and uh, industrial subsidy and investment policies and similar nationalistic brands of economic intervention. Uh, so mercantilism was a um, a very common system of um, of economic philosophy in the 18th century, and it emerged uh, very closely with slavery. In fact, slavery gets much of its state support and state subsidy out of mercantilist designs. The idea that uh, uh, the state should have a role in developing a, a plantation economy. So Becker, up until this point, is correctly noting what. Uh, Hundreds, if not thousands, of historians have observed before him that slavery and mercantilism emerged hand in hand. But then he does his sleight of hand, and then he does this definitional trick. He relabels mercantilism as war capitalism. Uh, it just basically says, uh, well, I'm going to call it something new, and now it's war capitalism. Uh, war capitalism can be connected to other forms of capitalism. And the step that's made from that to uh, the modern day is using the terminology to basically launch a blistering critique of uh, modern, more free market capitalism that was actually historically at odds with the very same mercantile system he described. Another historian, Walter Johnson, who uh, is a, a major contributor to this field, does the same thing. He reinvents mercantilism and uh, mercantile slave economies as uh, racial or slave capitalism. So it's just by playing these word games, these turns of phrase, that they have deemed something that historians have known about and studied and scrutinized for years as derivatives of, uh, of mercantile policy, and they've relabeled it, rebranded it capitalism. And one of the main motives of this seems to be the end goal of tainting capitalism today, tainting the name of capitalism today with the legacy of slavery. Yeah, it, it's so strange to me that uh, that historians do this. I think uh, in economics, usually if, if there's like a vague term, if it's not hammered down, usually economists will just sort of not use that and right. be like, well, you know, I, I, I don't want to. I can't nail down what is or isn't prosperity. So I'll talk about GDP, you know, or, right. or you know, which which is well defined, uh, you know, or uh, uh, well, we can't really define what is and isn't capitalism. So I'll just refer to the, um, you know, the score on the freedom of the world index, which is, again, right. well defined, uh, you know, uh, and then we can we can debate whether, you know, whether that is a, a good measure of, of things we care about and. The nice thing about it is, you know, once once we all agree that that's something worth talking about, then you can't then uh, pull the rug out from under and say, oh, actually, we're we're really talking about, you know, this this other thing. But I, I guess historians are kind of generally looking at a much broader, you know, that they, they have these projects to like talk about the, you know, the an entire era, an entire, you know, the entire southern antebellum slave economy and all of its effects going forward whereas an economist would be you know would find like one, one uh an economic historian might find a single data set and be like ah okay this shows 
you know, that A caused B and just have a very narrow scope. Right. <laughs> um, which, yeah. So just a very big difference in, uh, in sort of approach. Yeah. The, the difference in methodology, it's, uh, one's a quest for precision. Uh, one's a quest for trying to actually hammer down concrete answers to, uh, to, to, to questions about the past. The other is basically playing an exercise in word games to get from uh, um, a historical observation to an ideological point that they can use and in some cases even weaponize for their politics in the present day. Yeah, which is which is not not great for for an academic discipline um, and not great for really understanding what happened in the past. <laughs> kind of a, a, a little a bit of a, a shame that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that it happens that way but there there are people you know looking at these questions uh, i think we should try to like hammer down what some of those sort of empirical questions like if we were going to convert you know the claims or the the sort of arguments made in this literature to like you know clear empirical questions like if counterfactually america had abolished slavery in 1790 would gdp be higher or lower today something like that what what uh, what kind of, you know, if you were going to do that exercise, what kind of like questions would you would you want to ask? I think the very first thing would be to ascertain uh, what share of GDP is derived from slavery itself. And this has been a major point of contention that comes up in, in, in the debate between the economists and the historians here is um, is actually tracing the amount of economic activity that did historically derive from slavery. And we have some data on that effect. There have been uh, um, attempts to reconstruct uh, national counts or GDP data going back into the 19th century uh, using modern methods, and they get a pretty accurate picture. And from that, you can compare record books of, uh, of uh, U.S. production, imports and exports, things like that, to get um, estimates of the rough share of the economy that, uh, say, for example, was derived from uh, cotton production on the uh, – the plantations of the South or tobacco production or sugar production. And from that, you can get a rough estimate of uh, what share of economic output um, in the United States in the antebellum period was derived from and was coming from slavery. So economists have done that. And the general figure that's used, the pretty much consensus figure, is that on the eve of the Civil War in 1860, about 5 or 6% of U.S. GDP came from cotton production, uh, from cotton that was picked off of the fields uh, by slaves in the plantation south. So that's a, it's a fairly sizable industry. It's um, uh, to give some perspective in that era, that's roughly the same size as the railroad industry, which is the one of the dominant players in the northern economy. So um, it, it's by no means a small sector. It, it, it's a uh, a major contributor to the U.S. economy. But we also have to put it into some perspective. And what the new histor historians of capitalism have done is they've grossly overstated the importance of this one small but significant sector of the economy and tried to turn it into the dominant feature of American economic output on the eve of the Civil War. Uh, so Ed Baptist, who's another one of these major uh, contributors to the new history of capitalism school, he wrote a book uh, called The Half Has Never Been Told, in which he purports to calculate the share of GDP that's derived from plantation grown cotton and slavery. And what he does is he, he basically reinvents the mathematical formulas, the arithmetic that's used to calculate GDP and, and uses intermediate goods and all the different steps of production that go into cotton cultivation and ends up double and triple and in some cases probably even quadruple counting all the different components and ends up with this ridiculous statistic that claims that a full half of the American economy came from cotton production. Uh, so that's very useful for the new history of capitalism uh, literature that claims that uh, uh, you know American economic output and wealth is tied up almost exclusively in slavery, when actually the uh, the, the real figure, the economically responsible uh, approach that uses uh, standardized methods of the fields, finds that it's one tenth of that. Uh, so there's a big disparity between these two literatures that's emerged. So Baptist is is making this uh, this um, overwrought claim that slavery accounts for a full half of the economy, when in reality it's about five percent. 
of um, economic production tied to cotton production. So uh, that gap between the two has been one of the major empirical debates in the literature. And it's not something that, uh, that there, there's like a contest over the different methodologies. The economists are right in this, and Baptists is just making up stats out of thin air uh, or making up stats out of uh, novel calculation techniques that no, uh, no standard economist would use uh, and, and that don't even actually accurately uh, represent what he's purporting to claim. Uh, but the back and forth has been going on between the two camps of um, economists – who say that, yes, slavery is an important economic factor, but one among many and one that we need to put into historical perspective and consider against other areas of production that were going on at the time. And then on the other side, you have the historians camps that are claiming that slavery is the single dominant factor in the American economy at that time in history. One point that I, I like to uh, to bring out, and I think that's really illustrative of the um, – the issues at play here is that Ed Baptist number and some of these other historians that inflate the uh, the economic value attached to slavery on the eve of the Civil War are almost unwittingly echoing an argument that uh, all the secessionists and radical pro-slavery politicians uh, supporting the Confederacy were using in 1859 and 1860 and their call for uh, breaking away from the United States. So uh, you, you had a, uh, a, an explosion of literature in the 1850s that revolved around something that was known as the King Cotton thesis. And the idea is that cotton was so important, so central to the American economy at that time that any attempt to abolish slavery would wreck America or any attempt to disrupt the plantation system in any way through abolitionism, through a slave revolt – through uh, attempting to restrict the growth of slavery, would economically sink the United States. And uh, it was part a propaganda claim used to, to justify the slave system, to justify continuing uh, uh, this brutal and violent uh, means of extracting labor out of people by force. But it was also a political claim because the Southerner said that, hey, if you don't uh, uh, abide by our demands and respect slavery, if you don't enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, if you don't allow us to have our way, we're going to take our, uh, our segment of the country, our economy, and we're going to leave. And that's going to wreck you, the United States, because you're so dependent on cotton which is basically what they attempted to do in 1861. So they seceded and tried to remove the cotton economy that they were claiming was the engine of all American wealth at that time, but it didn't work out the way that they claimed. In fact, mm -hmm. it turned out to be the case that the North was uh, much more industrially developed. The North was on a much surer economic footing uh, to even wage the Civil War itself. Whereas this, this slave system that was supposedly the engine behind everything had actually stagnated the southern economy. It had impeded industrialization. It had impoverished regions that uh, otherwise might have developed on a, uh, uh, on a more natural course with free labor. It had it had basically put the South under its own economic handicap because they, they, they break away as their own secessionist country. But then they find out they have no industry. Mm. Next step, they think, yeah, well, yeah. well, cotton's still king, and the textile mills of Europe need our cotton to uh, to make their products. So we'll just trade with them, and we'll use the economic position of our export crop uh, to uh, to wield our kingship, but basically over the over the world economy. But uh, two things mm -hmm. happen there: first, the Union blockades the South and cuts it off, and second, the South says, well. In order to extract diplomatic recognition from the European powers, we're going to basically self-embargo our cotton. We're going to use it both as, as the carrot and the stick to try to draw them into the war on our behalf. Uh, so they approach England and they approach France with offers and say, we'll give you access to our cotton crop if you enter militarily on our side and help us win this war and give us diplomatic recognition. Britain and, and France basically balk at it, and they go to other places in the world to produce cotton. So they just substitute away to another source. So it turns out that King Cotton is a pretender to the throne. It's not the king of anything at all. It's actually a, a, a much smaller economic sector, and it doesn't wield anywhere near the power that the Confederates thought it did. 
So this has been regarded for the past 150 years as kind of this propagandistic junk version of economic history that uh, was used as a political tool to justify slavery and justify the Confederacy, uh, but no one really took it seriously as economic history. And yet here we are 150 years later, and we've got this new, new school of historians who have unwittingly stumbled onto the same arguments, and now they're insisting that, ca- that Cotton was in fact king after all, that Cotton was in fact the driver of American uh, economic development and prosperity. Uh, they're basically saying that James Henry Hammond and Lewis Wigfall and all these radical fire-reading secessionist Southerners on the eve of the Civil War were right. Even though uh, the new historians today would disagree with them on slavery, they think that the uh, the King Cotton theorists have the economics of of slavery correct. Yeah. It so so is the book title Empire of Cotton unintentionally echoing King Cotton? It it seems like it couldn't possibly be be uh, unintentional, but maybe it is. <laughs> well, I, I'd say more hapless than anything. I think these uh, these are scholars yeah. that are so uh, ideologically set upon indicting capitalism by tying it to slavery that they've adopted the route of linking everything to cotton. And once you link everything to cotton, you basically open the door and admit this King Cotton thesis into existence. It, it, you, you start bestowing it uh, validity that it never actually had. Uh, and one of the exercises, so I wrote a, uh, a book chapter that basically diagnoses and runs through the historiography of this, uh, this new school and compares it to some older works of economic history. And you can put patch- passages side by side from this tract from 1856 by an economist uh, named David Christie, who basically mapped out the King Cotton theory of economic development. You can put the passages side by side with Ed Baptist and Sven Beckert. And they're basically making the same claims. They're basically saying cotton is so important that uh, if we removed it from economic production, it would destroy the finance industry. It would destroy shipping. It would destroy uh, the uh, uh, the entire merchant industry of cross-Atlantic trade. It would cripple the textile mills of the north and cripple the textile mills of England and France and the rest of the European continent. You have these claims side by side from two different tracks 150 years apart, and they've almost unwittingly discovered the same economic argument, although one was a pro-slavery version of it, and today's an anti-capitalistic version of it that uh, nonetheless recognizes the wrong of slavery uh, in association with that anti-capitalism. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's interesting how sort of uh, social science and history can be political tools in any time and right. <laughs> served, you know, the, the same, the same weapon serving different masters, the same argument. Yeah. Since this whole, uh, this whole, um, controversy broke out, I've been reading a lot about the cotton economy and, uh, you know, the, when the, the civil war is just an amazing natural experiment for, you know, if we, if we really want to know like how important was Southern cotton, well, it suddenly went off the world market uh, all at once. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you, you, as you mentioned, it, you saw the uh, India and Egypt in particular increasing their cotton production. Um, and, so, you know, the, the British textile mills had to retool for the, the um, shorter fibers coming from uh, Egypt and India. Uh, but, you know, that actually created a, a bit of an economic boom in Egypt where, you know, they were... Right. Right. converting you know large large areas of uh, agriculture to this cash crop and building railways and stuff it's an right. interesting period for them um but yeah just kind of in terms of counterfactuals we we look at an economy that uh uses lots of cotton and you know and and is a pretty big uh but not half the economy but you know big ish industry and it's just it's just a substitute for other cotton grown elsewhere or maybe other fibers and and we see that substitution you know when when people had to make it they made it really quickly so uh you know you can't really attribute you know long run economic growth to uh to an industry that was easily replaced in within you know a short time frame Right. And this is not only something we recognize today, it's something that was known and widely recognized and written about in the time itself as the Civil War is playing out. Uh, So one of the main uh, uh, cotton industry 
uh, figures in Great Britain at the time was a member of parliament by the name of John Bright, and he's a radical abolitionist. He's someone who's been fighting the slave trade and fighting the, the institution of slavery for decades before the Civil War comes along. And you find his speeches that are given in Parliament and given across Britain um, during the middle of the, of the American Civil War. He's urging the country to avoid the Confederacy and to side with the North, even though he knows it means that uh, there's going to be this temporary short-term uh, cutoff of the flow of cotton raw materials into Britain, something that affected his own industry materially. And in fact, affected his own constituency. He says we need to defeat slavery uh, because that's the more pressing uh, demand here. That's the moral charge, and part of that involves defeating the Confederacy in the war. So he's one of the, he ends up becoming one of the major figures that keeps Britain out of the war on the Confederate side. Uh, he he's one of the major voices that uh, that pressures the government to stay neutral and to avoid any entanglement, uh, to basically reject the King Cotton diplomacy that the South was trying. Uh, so this isn't something that's just uh, we notice through economic history. It's something that was noticed and and that uh, people were very aware of uh, in the time itself that these events are playing out. And yet we have a, a whole class of historians today that are uninterested in that story, and rather they're trying to retrofit uh, bits and pieces of history into a modern political narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so you you uh, you've recently been writing about um, you know about the relationship between uh, slavery and and economic development, but also between abolitionism and economic development. Do you want to uh, summarize the uh, the article you wrote about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this goes back to Adam Smith himself. So all the classical economists were deeply concerned with slavery. They considered it a uh, a uh, distortion on economic exchange. That they considered it this inheritance from a uh, an earlier mercantile regime. Uh, that was kind of like this millstone around the neck of the economy on economic development. Uh, so you find from Smith all the way through the Civil War a succession of economists, free market economists, people we consider the uh, uh, the, the founding figures of uh, modern capitalistic theory today, are also abolitionists. In fact, they're so closely associated with abolitionism that some of the early attacks on the economics discipline itself were premised on the fact that it had united the cause of abolishing slavery with the cause of free trade and abolishing tariffs. So the most famous instance of this is uh, um, a pamphlet that a, uh, a writer that's somewhat known today, but uh, was very famous in his own day, by the name of Tar Thomas Carlyle. Uh, he's a Scottish uh, liter literary man and historian, uh, very popular uh, writer of histories of the French Revolution, wrote several literary works and political commentaries. In 1849, he published this vehemently racist pamphlet that denounced what he called the dismal science. And the dismal science was the economics of Adam Smith, the economics of free markets and supply and demand. And the reason he was de denouncing the dismal science related to the political events of the day he, note, he had noted that the uh, British Anti-Slavery Society, which included members such as John Bright and Richard Cobden, the famous anti-corn law uh, crusaders of the British political scene, had also made political alliance with the abolitionists, that they had incorporated a doctrine of abolitionism and free trade uh, brought them together as this uh, – uh, this economic platform that Britain's liberals would bring to the world. Uh, so Carlyle is arguing against this, and he deems economics the dismal science because he sees economics as a threat to slavery. Economics is the the uh, uh, the, the tool that ruined, in his mind, uh, the British colonial plantation system in the Caribbean and would continue to ruin what remained of slavery in the United States and in other countries on the continent. Uh, so he merges the two, declares economics the dismal science because the economists want to free the slaves. That's the history of the term. Jump across the Atlantic, and what we find is that uh, Carlyle actually has intellectual followers and progeny that are writing on the American scene about the institution of slavery, uh, the foremost of which is a, a fellow by the name of George Fitzhugh. And Fitzhugh 
is kind of seen as a good way to think of him is he's the anti William Lloyd Garrison. He's the anti abolitionist uh, intellectual figure of the South at the same time that Garrison is, is leading the abolitionist ch- charge from the North uh, through his publication, The Liberator. So Fitzhugh is this pamphleteer and writer who uh, who puts out pro-slavery tracts that are intended to counter the abolitionist arguments for uh, getting rid of the institution. Uh, and part of Fitzhugh's tracts uh, appear in a magazine known as The Bowes Review that was circulated across the South. Uh, so he's a regular editorialist uh, in one of the most prominent magazines that um, existed at the time. Uh, but he's also a, um, a a writer of several books. He, he puts uh, two books out. One's called A Sociology for the South, and the second is, is called Cannibals All or Slaves Without Masters. And these books lay out a um, an, an extreme radical pro-slavery theory of reordering the economy of not just the South, but the entire United States around a slave production system. And one of the reasons he does so is uh, he makes an observation of the northern factories, and he deems those factories as exploitative of their their wage laborers, their workers. Uh, so in a sense, uh, Fitzhugh is not only a follower and disciple of Carlyle in attacking the dismal science, he's also a proto-Marxist. He's someone who discovers uh, what we would now refer to as the Marxist theory of surplus value. He thinks that wage labor allows the capitalist class to underpay the people that are working under it and to seize the difference between the wage and the value of their production and uh, convert that into his own wealth. So, uh, uh, Fitzhugh develops this elaborate theory in 1854, uh, which is more than a decade before Karl Marx essentially writes down the exact same thing. But the one twist is, instead of a proletarian revolution to resolve it and allow the worker to reclaim this this so-called posited surplus value that they're being deprived of by the capitalist, Fitzhugh says we need to just bring the entire system under a nationwide economy of slavery. And he says slavery will resolve the same issues that uh, the socialists otherwise complain about in the alienation of the worker from the fruits of his labor, because the slave owner is the paternalist. The slave owner is the father figure who who basically absorbs all the costs of provision for his and uh, his uh, workers, his enslaved persons. Uh, so, so it's almost uh, taking this Marxist paradigm and then turning the solution on its head to argue in favor of slavery. But Fitzhugh writes this tract, and the very opening chapter of the Sociology for the South is not an attack on the abolitionists. It's an attack on free trade. It's an attack on Adam Smith. It's an attack on the free market capitalist economists. Uh, it's, It's basically a polemical tirade where he says the South must shed any any connection whatsoever or any inclination it has towards free market economists, it must cast the doctrines of Adam Smith and David Ricardo and J.B. Say into the fire. It must reject free markets. It must reject capitalism and embrace slavery as the natural order of things. And it must do so in order not only to uh, uh, advance itself economically, but to paterna- paternalistically absorb the role of the worker, i.e. the slave, into a full nationalistic economic system. So it's this really perverse, brutal, twisted and warped doctrine, but it's anti-capitalistic to the core. And this is the main advocate of pro-slavery economics. This is one of the main informants of the King Cotton theory as it's emerging in the late 1850s. This is one of the main articulators of pro-slavery economic ideology, and he's an anti-capitalist, anti-capitalist to the core. Uh, He even says that socialism, to be perfected, must be united with slavery. He says that slavery is the world's most perfect system of socialism, and the two doctrines need to recognize uh, their compatibility with each other and, and unite in making war upon free market capitalism. So you have this whole intellectual history of the most radical examples of pro-slavery theorists on the eve of the Civil War 
also happen to be anti-capitalists. And yet they're almost entirely excluded from this new history of capitalism uh, genre that's emerged in the history literature today. Uh, almost none of them will discuss Fitzhugh or some of his fellow travelers, travelers who argue these these same theorists because they throw basically an intellectual wrench into this ideological mission to link capitalism and slavery. You can't have capitalism linked to slavery when the leading pro-slavery theorists are anti-capitalists themselves. So that's the great irony of it all. Yeah, Fitzhugh is is such an interesting figure and and so so bizarre. Like you know, if someone uh, if we heard someone tr- linking um, slavery and socialism together today, we'd assume that they were doing that, you know, as as a as a sort of uh, way of criticizing socialism, not as as a right, not not just doing it in a very sort of genuine and uh, you know unironic uh, argument uh, for both, right. Well, yeah. I think in a, in a weird in a weird way, Fitzhugh may be in a, a more honest version of a socialist than many of the socialists themselves. Uh, you know, whether it's the plantation of the slavery or, or the slavery of the plantation or the slavery of the gulag, it's a, it's effectively the same type of a system uh, that results from both of their respective uh, arguments. And I think one of the one of the hesitances that you see among these modern historians to uh, to actually engage with the anti-capitalism that's prevalent in Fitzhugh is uh, they look at his writings and, and they're actually a little bit alarmed about how close some of his anti-capitalistic rhetoric, some of his indictments and attacks on uh, on the factory owners and some of his articulations of a surplus value theory or articulations of uh, labor alienation from the fruits of its uh, production match the Marxian visions that they all, they also happen to personally agree with. So it's a, it's basically a pro-slavery spin on Marxist economics, and I think they're alarmed at the similarities b- uh, between the two. So they uh, uh, that th- they view him and they won't touch him with a ten foot pole because the similarities are so pronounced. They run the other direction and try to write this guy out of the history books. Try to pretend as if uh, he's not a factor in uh, in the actual discussion that's going on here. Yeah, what well, one really interesting thing about Fitzhugh is just the you know, America has a basically race-based slavery and your Fitzhugh is making this sort of race-free argument for slavery that actually and I I think he takes it to its logical conclusion and uh says that uh you know, poor white workers should uh should be slaves too. Does he not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's not just the black workers. He he also says there's a white underclass that is naturally situated to be enslaved. So uh, mm. it's slavery writ large. Uh, he's the ultimate in uh, plantation elitist. He views himself as as the very top rung of the paternalistic society, and the rest should all fall into place underneath him. Yeah, I mean there there was like presumably. In addition to Fitzhugh, there were there were a lot of sort of southern southerners justifying slavery on racial grounds. The sort of idea yeah, that uh, that uh, black people could not uh, take care of themselves, so they needed uh, the, the paternalism of of being owned in order to to even uh, manage their lives. That that was that was also prevalent, but it just wasn't in in Fitzhugh in this sort of uh, you know uh, scientific. Uh, attempt to justify the slave system. Right, right, right. You, so you see uh, adaptation is that. So James Henry Hammond, who's the uh, U.S. senator from South Carolina on the eve of the Civil War, takes a version of this argument where he basically says society should be be structured in um, in hierarchies, that there's a planter class at the top, but then there's a laborer class beneath it, an African-American labor class, and they're the slaves. And he calls them the mud sill upon which uh, uh, all of society is built. And he says that, that basically the slave class is needed to allow the, uh, the paternalist uh, superior class, the slave owners, uh, to advance civilization. So it's, it's this really racist contortion of a hierarchy, but it's effectively the same thing. And he's one of the major King Cotton theorists that thinks that the entire uh, uh, American economy is going to be driven and bowed down before this, uh, this form of production. And then that's what's going to ensure its superiority and its victory in the Civil War, which turns out not to be the case at all.
Yeah, so so we're um we're getting to the end of our time. Do you have sort of a and you know a, a final thought on this topic for someone who's listened to it? Uh, any sort of overarching message that they should take away from this whole topic? Yeah, aside from being skeptical of the new history of capitalism literature, what I'd urge pretty much anyone that's interested in studying the subject to do is to look beyond that literature. And there's really a deficiency in several of the works, people like uh, Sven Becker and Ed Baptist that are uh, are arguing this capitalism and slavery thesis. Not only are they ideological in their disposition, but they've ignored basically a half century of deep empirical work by economists who've been investigating the same questions that they purport to be interested in. Uh, so there's a vast extensive literature on the history of slavery and its relationship to economics that goes well beyond what's presented in the 1619 project and well beyond what's presented in this supposed new history of capitalism. And and that that literature actually tends to be much more attuned to empirical evidence. It isn't making some of the basic mistakes that you find about uh, the calculation of GDP or the assigning of cause uh, between how cotton relates to the rest of the economy. Rather, it's a literature that tries to investigate uh, what's the role of the government in enforcing and subsidizing and propping up slave production, and how does that relate to the inefficiencies and and, uh, other deficiencies that come with slave production vis-a-vis free labor. So uh, one of the theses that I think is really uh, promising, really interesting to investigate right now is that – uh, government subsidy through things like fugitive slave enforcement, uh, through paying for militias and paying for armies to put down slave insurrections, to everything, even down to, to uh, the simple censorship of the mail to keep um, abolitionist literature out of it. These are all government actions that can be viewed as economic subsidies to make slavery itself viable. Uh, so the question we need to be asking, what would happen if you took away fugitive slave enforcement? What would happen if you took away uh, the military expenditures that are, are are made to police and put down slave revolts? What would happen if you took away censorship uh, and, and all these other horrendous infringements upon uh, personal freedom that are actually coming out of direct state subsidy uh, to the slave economy? Well, that alters the profitability of slavery itself. It's it's basically a rent extraction story rather than a capitalism story, and the rents are that the Southerners, the plantation owners, had been able to co-opt elements of the U.S. government and re-divert those resources into propping up plantation slavery production in ways that they could not pay for themselves. So they basically made it a into a public industry. Uh, they made it into something that was supported by the state. So the real interesting literature, the real uh, interesting historical questions to be asking are how do we trace the role of the U.S. government's uh, history of involvement in the slave economy? And you can get that going all the way back to the very beginning through the Civil War era. And one of the arguments I really make, uh, and I've published this in several places, is that uh, the Southern secessionists, one of the main reasons that they left is that they saw the election of Abraham Lincoln. They saw the uh, ascendant uh, uh, political movement of the Republican Party as a threat to take away all those subsidies that they had been enjoying for the better part of a century. It was a threat to take away enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act. It was a, a threat to take away public expenditures to keep the slave system going. And when you reorient the question along those lines, it's not a matter of of slavery uniting with capitalism. It's a matter of slavery uniting with the government. I think that's the real takeaway that historians need to be investigating. And on that note, my guest today has been Phil Magnus. Phil, thanks for being on Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me. concludes the second episode of my series on slavery. If all goes well, I'll have at least one more, maybe maybe even more than that. Uh, if you're enjoying this series, uh, you can let me know by leaving a comment in the Facebook group. That's Economics Detective on Facebook. You need to request to enter the group, but I'm not turning anyone down, so don't worry about uh, not being able to get into this very exclusive club. If you really enjoy the show, you can support us on Patreon. Uh, That's patreon.com slash economicsdetective, where you can make a per-episode 
donation to the show. And on that note, I'll be back soon with a new episode. Thanks for listening. And thanks for those of you who share the episode on social media or with your friends and family. I do not have a marketing budget, so the show spreads mainly through word of mouth and through uh, people just discovering it uh, through their friends. So anything you can do to promote the show, if, if you like it, if you know people who you think will like it, it's really helpful. Thanks, and I'll be back soon. Thank you.